Our next speaker is Mr. Link Williams, again speaking as a private citizen. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Link Williams. I'm a documentary filmmaker, but uh, I'm here talking today about my experience with NRTs. Um, so I'm going to briefly run you through my experience, what I think the future of NRTs are, and then my recommendations for what I think actions should be. So a little bit of history from me. I was a uh, I smoked for 23 years, and I'm just going to get this out of the way. The only person I blame for my smoking is myself. Not the tobacco companies, not any of that. I made the choice. I fully knew that it would probably kill me, but I chose to take up the habit anyway. I was young. I wasn't necessarily the, uh, making, making the wisest decisions, but uh, I did it. So 17 years of... Uh, of, of that 23 years, I actually was on the road of trying to quit. The last 10 years of that, I was a four plus a day smoker of cigarette packs. I went through multiple cartons in a week. I tried patches. I tried the gum. I tried lozenges. Uh, I even tried hypnotherapy, which lasted, I think, about somewhere around seven minutes. Um, of effective. Um, I bought magnets to put along my wrist and on my ears, uh, but none of that helped. Um, I tried Wellbutrin, um, didn't affect it at all, um, and I had a severe reaction to Chantix. I, uh, after about three to four days of taking Chantix, I started having uncontrollable rage um, and suicidal thoughts. Uh, luckily, my family was keen enough to recognize it, to get me to a doctor, and to get treatment to be able to get off of the Chantix. Within two weeks of being off the Chantix, I was back to my normal self. But I was one of those few where you hear the stories of Chantix is, you know, has side effects. I got to see it firsthand, um, and it was not a pleasant experience. Um, I've also done support groups, Smokers Anonymous. Um, and uh, guided helplines where you would call and daily they would call you and remind you of why you were quitting and all of that. My longest quit period was uh, actually using a combination of wearing 24 milligram patches and then when I, the urge really came along, using nicotine lozenges to get me through those urges. And that lasted nine months until I revealed to my doctor that I was doing that and I was told it was extremely bad for my health and I had to stop. Within stopping of using the uh, nicotine lozenges with the patches, within three weeks I was back to smoking again. My average quit time was about one month. Um, some of them a little less. The hypnotherapy was, I said, about seven minutes. Uh, my wife and, and I estimate that I've uh, literally spent close to $17,000 on cessation gimmicks, products, et cetera, over the course of that 17 years. So it's been a significant investment for it. So three years ago, I was 342 pounds, massively overweight. I was a type 2 diabetic. I still am a type 2 diabetic. I was taking 180 units of Humalog a day. Um, I was also taking eight oral medications uh, to be able to go through it. I could barely climb and walk a, a set of stairs. And I had resigned myself to the fact that I was never going to quit smoking. Today, I've now been 28 months smoke-free. I'm now 240 pounds. Not exactly a fit and thin, what I would consider a model of health, but I, uh, a, a dramatic improvement uh, just in my life and that. I'm still diabetic because you're never really not diabetic. Um, but I no longer take insulin. Insulin. I no longer have to take any oral medication. I just have to control my diet um, and exercise. Uh, and there's a little typo on this. I apologize. In October 2012, which is uh, just a couple months ago, I ran my first uh, 5K, uh, which if you would ask me three years ago if I was going to even run a block, I would have laughed and said that time of my life had had gone by. Um, and today I'm resigned to never smoke another cigarette again. But 
I still use nicotine. I use nicotine in multiple formats. Um, I wasn't, so how did I get to here today? I wasn't trying to quit. That was the first thing that came out. I didn't want to quit. Um, I did it because my goal was to try and save some money and cut back on my consumption and try not to smell like cigarettes around my wife and daughter. Because they were the biggest naggers in my life, and I love them. Um, but every day it was come home, go take a shower. Just because of uh, the smell. I used cigarettes with my choices of nicotine for three months. Dual user. But a lot of people talk about this dual user thing. I smoked four packs a day. When I was dual using, I was smoking less than a pack a day. So there was a benefit to that. Now, after three months, it turned out I liked the alternatives better than actual smoking. My taste started to return those type of uh, things. And also, by not smoking and using the nicotine alternatives, my entire diet changed. The McDonald's greasy hamburger didn't taste as good as it used to. Um, simple things like salad and blue cheese. The, the taste returned. I know you can do it. Um, so, oh, and I forgot to mention, my choice of nicotine today is electronic cigarettes and snooze. Um, and the, I would include nicotine lozenges on that, but when I compare the price of nicotine lozenges to the other alternatives, it just doesn't make sense uh, for me. I think if there were a lower uh, price alternative, then potentially uh, that that would be something that would be uh, included in my thing. I am resigned to, I will never give up nicotine. I'm a nicer person with nicotine. I enjoy my life with nicotine, and I don't have the serious health benefits that I had with smoking. Um, so the future. So the things I would like to encourage you to do is, one, I want to see NRTs encouraged for people to use for long term. This 8 to 12 weeks is not enough to really break a cycle of smoking. Um, I'd also like to see it encouraged for temporary use. Um, I got into it because I wanted to temporarily uh, not smoke, to be able to go out and say, wear a patch when you're on a plane so that you, that you can get through the flight. Those type of things, I'd like to see that happen. Um, because of my experience with the unsuccessful, I don't think that NRT products should be a tobacco dependence product. Um, I think they should be a tobacco harm reduction uh, product because I think they fail significantly when they're used just as a tobacco dependence product. My personal experience with Chantix, I would encourage you to, I would like to see it removed from the market completely, um, especially since the reactions that I had to it and no kind of real warning other than little small printed text at the bottom uh, wasn't sufficient. So I think the public needs to to be informed about that. Um, I'd like to see uh, the, the government invest in harm reduction strategies as opposed to abstinence only um, strategies. And I'd like to see them promote a multi-vector program for tackling harm reduction as well as lifestyle improvement. And when I say multi-vector, I think it's about finding that not everybody is the same. And right now when you've gotten down to smokers, they are uh, I'm running out of time. They are different, uh, very different. The ones that we're going to quit have quit. The tough cases are really what's left. Final recommendations include stakeholders. This is the first opportunity I've seen to, for as a smoker to be able to come in and talk. I want to see more smokers, ex-smokers, NRT users participating in panels and providing feedback and making that information available. And I'd also encourage you to invite groups like CASA and AIMSA and SAFTA who are interested in the industry and who are trying to improve things and bring them to the table and have discussions with them. I know my time ran out. I apologize. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your personal story with us. Um, so we have data that supports that NRTs and Chantix 
help some people quit, not everybody, not even necessarily the majority of people that are seeking to quit, but we have data that support that the products help some people quit and do it safely and effectively, which is why they're approved. So um, I want to be sure I'm understanding that you're, are you approaching this as an either or? Are you suggesting by unapproving that we not be thinking about those people that can benefit from those drugs as they are currently approved and remove all that and just be looking towards long-term use or, or not towards long-term use. My what, personal what you, belief is that through tobacco harm reduction strategies, those people, that 5% that would successfully quit, would still quit using a THR route as opposed to just going and promoting. I think you get much greater public benefit by encouraging the harm reduction strategies. You will find more who are able to successfully quit over the long run than just the three to five to even 10% that use those uh, to quit. I'm not saying don't use it as a cessation. Ultimately, cessation should be um, a, uh, the ideal golden path. But I'm saying if you only pursue the ideal golden path, you lose 90%. May I follow up then? So, so when you're saying unapprove, you're not really meaning that. You're meaning that there could be multiple paths to a goal to improve the public health. Is that what you're saying? The only one I say unapprove really for is Chantix. And that is my personal experience and not being educated on what the real risk of using Chantix. Now I understand I'm a small percentage uh, that reacted uh, in that way, but there's still a significant amount that there are actually deaths associated uh, with it. My personal belief is because it was fast-tracked, that there wasn't actually enough studies on it, and when you start to mess with the chemistry of brain, um, that I don't think any type of non-nicotine-based uh, product should be fast-tracked through. It's my personal opinion. And one more follow-up question. Um, I see that in your personal story, you were able to stop smoking for nine months completely mm -hmm. with nothing else, right? No, well, we're using a combination of a patch and nicotine lozenges. Okay. Okay. Yeah. My best cold turkey attempt was less than a month. Thank you. It's sort of a two-step question. Um, it seems that you finally were able to stop when you added in the electronic cigarette. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That's correct. So what do you think about that made the difference compared to using other nicotine replacement systems? It brought the pleasure back into it. No offense, a patch and a lozenge, you get no real pleasure from it. The act of smoking exits all the, the bad things about it. The inhaling, the exhaling, it's very pleasurable. And all those times when I really struggled for a cigarette, after a meal, driving along car drives. Patches and lozenges just do not do that. And they happen to catch us in our weakest moment. Um, as when I ended up quitting, it was from ranging from items of, I had a death in the family, to, oh, somebody just ran a red light. Those were all things that would trigger me to go back to smoking. Because really, living day by day thinking about smoking, anything can trigger you to come back to it. With the electronic cigarette, I still feel like I'm smoking. I get that social interaction of it. It's really that breathing in and breathing out. And I didn't list it on there, but I tried the Nicotrol inhaler. And it was one of the most horrible, unpleasant experiences uh, I had uh, had. It had no kind of, it was more like trying to punish myself from wanting, uh, not having a cigarette as opposed to do it. So the electronic cigarette really brings that social aspect, that really that, that the hand, eye, mouth, the, all of those things that I found pleasurable about smoking back into the equation. And it literally was relatively easy once I had that. Yes, ma'am. 
So would you recommend that the manufacturers of the e-cigarettes um, do the studies and, and come in uh, for a cessation indication? Um, to be honest, no. Uh, because all the manufacturers of the e-cigarettes don't play on the same level that the FDA plays. Most manufacturers and vendors that I know make less than $1 million a year. That's not even really enough uh, to, to fill up the paperwork. Um, the industry is, is not there. Now you have large players like Lorillard and Enjoy and those, but those don't really represent the core of, uh, of this industry. The core of this industry is the, the small shops that have gone out and found, spread the word and, and put those things out there. Um, so to go and become a cessation uh, product is just too expensive. You don't make it realistic for this industry, a new industry burgeoning, for them to be able to practically do that. And I'll say the same thing with making it a modified risk tobacco product. The research requirements uh, based on that basically say, don't try. Yes, ma'am. Hi there, thank you for your story. It was very informative. Um, I actually have two questions. You have mentioned that 12 weeks is not long-term. What would be a reasonable long-term period? Should it be indefinite or should there be a goal that um, we're looking for? Sure, I, I, I think there is no set limit on it. I know I had a professor in college that managed to quit smoking for four years but used a uh, patch for the entire four years. Um, I think it's individual based, but I think by saying that you're only supposed to use this product for 8 to 12 weeks, you, even though I know plenty of people who use them well beyond that, you put a stigma on them. Uh, there's something wrong. People should only use this for 12 weeks and now I've been using this for 9 months. There must be something wrong with me. Um, and demoralizing and de demonizing a person who's trying to go through and quit and change their life, unfortunately it just doesn't work. It makes them back go, go back to being closet smokers. And my second question is, what I'm hearing a lot is short of tobacco cessation, meaning not using any tobacco product. We should be offering a routes where the goal should be smoking cessation. Am I correct? 100%. And um, so that should be a goal or perhaps a new um, efficacy measure, so to speak, that we should be looking at. Then in what you're proposing in terms of using the nicotine replacement um, various products, perhaps indefinitely, then should that be um, looked at as nicotine or tobacco maintenance? That would be an acceptable public health goal? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. One, I think nicotine and tobacco, uh, when, we, when we look at the actual lower harm alternatives to it, so I'm going to say the Swedish snus, which has low in, uh, nitrosamines, or the lozenge, lozenge, I think those are perfectly acceptable lifestyle uh, habits, especially when we compare it to people who drink a pot of coffee a day. Um, I don't think the goal should be maintenance. I think the goal should be quitting smoking, removing the primary harm agent, and then letting people live their lives um, after that. I, if I had my way, I would say all NRT projects were over the counter, low cost, and available to everybody at any time to use however they want. Um, the, one of the biggest barriers that you, I think you have in the NRT world is the patches are ridiculously expensive. When I look at the a lozenge, I would pay $24 to $40 for a box of lozenges, but I can pay $3 for a can of snus. Thank you. Sort of following up on that, yeah, I think what you said is that when you're doing the uh, nicotine patch and the lozenges, your doctor then said that you shouldn't be doing that. It's for such that, a long time. What if, what if your doctor had said, great, that's working for you, keep it up. What do you think would have happened? I think I'd still be on that today. Hopefully at lower nicotine level, but I think I would still be doing it because the patch 
while it gives me a baseline nicotine level, you need something, at least I need something for those high stress spike uh, type of uh, environments. And often that would be around another smoker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much appreciated.